program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, attention all cars, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. Broadcast 86. The body of an unidentified woman found in a sack near San Fernando. That's all. Rose and quick. <laughs> has marched another step ahead. In northern Nevada, the citizens of Reno now enjoy police car performance, and with the addition of Phoenix, Arizona, to the long list of cities now using Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively, it is now more true than ever that throughout California, Arizona, and Nevada, more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, motorcycles, more emergency equipment of every type are powered by Rio Grande Crack and by all other brands of gasoline combined. Why did Phoenix decide to change to Rio Grande Crack? Not because of price, not because of politics, but because of the performance of this outstanding gasoline. For a long time, the Maricopa County Arizona Sheriff's cars have been using Rio Grande Crack gasoline. They have made greater speed had greater power than ever before, and records prove it costs less per mile to operate a car on Rio Grande cracked gasoline. That's why Phoenix, Arizona's capital and largest city, has changed to Rio Grande. And that's why the big California cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Bakersfield, Los Angeles, and many others, specify Rio Grande cracked for all emergency cars. When are you going to change? Rio Grande's independent service stations offer you the same cracked gasoline that these cities are using. With a tank full of Rio Grande cracks, your car, too, will give police car performance. Tonight it is our privilege to welcome to Calling All Cars the famous sheriff of Los Angeles County, Gene Biscalou, who will tell you how the deputies in his office proceed to solve crime. Sheriff Biscalou. First, let me correct the common misunderstanding of what constitutes a detective. There's a lot of misinforming ballyhoo turned out regarding the romance of being a detective. In the 28 years I have spent in the sheriff's office, I have failed to find any of this romance. Sherlock Holmes was a very interesting figure with his fore and aft cap and his magnifying glass. And Philo Vance is undoubtedly thrilling to the lovers of detective fiction, with his suave sophistication and his cane and spat. But I have never run into either of them when there is any real police work to be done. We law enforcement officers are concerned with facts, not thrilling fiction, and for that reason our lives and our activities, I am sorry to have to assure you, are not half as fascinating as you may think them. The case you are about to hear does not make a good detective story. In it you will encounter no amazing scientific sleuthing, you will hear no Superman deduction, but you will see how we set about to solve a crime. We know that most criminals make stupid breaks and blunders. Our deputy sheriffs, by common sense and hard work, ferret out these inconsistencies. Not one of our men considers himself a genius, yet we have successfully solved 98% of our cases. The secret of being a detective is discovering the mistakes which every criminal is bound to make. Our story begins on Christmas Day, eight years ago. My chief criminal deputy, Captain William J. Bright, was just finishing his Christmas dinner. Uh, that, my dear, is the best Christmas dinner I have ever eaten. Thanks, Bill. 
From the looks of that turkey carcass, you seem to have enjoyed it. I did, but I'm not through yet. Now, if you'll just pass me another piece of that mince pie, I'll... Oh, why, Bill, you'll burn. <laughs> oh, there's the phone. I'll answer it. Here, you enjoy your pie. And if it's anybody from the sheriff's office, tell them I'm... Well, tell them anything. I, I don't want to be bothered. Dr. McMillan ain't in, and I don't expect him back tonight. 
pretty definite about it, eh, Bert? I'll say. I guess we better try again. I told you Dr. McMillan ain't in. We're deputy sheriffs, ma'am. And we want to know how to reach Dr. McMillan. It's important. I told you he ain't in. He won't be in tonight at all. What's his apartment number? Apartment 7. But he ain't there. We'll see about that. Fine, at least he's under orders. Yeah. Let's see. Apartment 7. Uh, it's just down the hall here. Yeah, there it is. There's somebody moving around in there. Uh, we'll know pretty quick. You Dr. McMillan? Yes. You're uh, under arrest. What? what? I, I don't understand. The captain will tell you all about it down at headquarters. Uh, he wants to ask you some questions. What's the idea of all the papers spread on the floor, Doctor? Figuring on leaving town? No, I, I was just looking through some things of mine. Mm, some things of yours. Most of these papers seem to bear Mrs. Appleby's name. Well, yes, some of them are Mrs. Appleby's. I'm handling her affairs. I'm her manager. Where is she now? Who, uh, Mrs. Appleby? Yes. Why, uh, she's gone to San Diego. Look at this, Mr. John. Black glove, right-handed. Whose glove is this, Doctor? Uh, why, uh, I guess it's mine. Yeah? Put it on. Very well, Well, I could have told you it wouldn't fit. Come along. We're going to talk to the captain. Without telling Dr. McMillan the reason for his arrest, Captain Bright questioned him for hours, during which he discovered that the doctor had met Mrs. Appleby at church and that after they became fast friends, she employed him to handle her affairs. Then he veers the questioning to the doctor's professional background. You have been practicing medicine in Los Angeles, Doctor? No, I, I've i been interested in uh, real estate since I came out to the coast. I see. Uh, where have you practiced medicine? Well, I uh, was in St. Louis for a while, and uh, then in Bobbin, Texas. I, I had a practice in uh, Pantersville, Texas, for eight years. And uh, when did you come to Los Angeles? Uh, about uh, four years ago. Done pretty well in the real estate business? Oh, I can't complain. Things, things haven't been so good lately, though. <laughs> Is that the reason you killed Mrs. Appleby? What? Why did you kill Mrs. Appleby? I didn't kill her. She's not dead. Here's a picture of her body wrapped in a canvas sack as she was found in a wet field near San Fernando. You left her like this. No, no, you, you must be mistaken, Captain. I, I, I can't believe that Mrs. Appleby is dead. I, I, I saw her only a few days before Christmas. She told me she was going to San Diego and uh, asked me to be sure to rent her house for her. Oh, no, Captain, Mrs. Appleby isn't dead. She's, she's in San Diego. Well, perhaps you're right. We can make mistakes like other human beings. Surely this is one of them, then. I notice among the papers we found in your apartment, uh, this will in your favor made out by Mrs. Appleby on hotel stationery. Oh, yes, uh, Mrs. Appleby uh, gave me that as proof of my authority to, uh, to handle her affairs. Doesn't look like a very business-like authorization to handle a million-dollar estate. Oh, <laughs> That's the way Mrs. Appleby does things. I see. Rather eccentric, eh? Yes, I suppose you could call her that. Uh, where were you on Christmas Day, Doctor? Uh, Christmas Day? and uh, Well, I... I took some presents to my wife in the morning. Oh, your wife? Oh, you're married, then? Uh, oh, uh, yes, but uh, separated. All right. Christmas presents in the morning. What did you do the rest of the day? Well, I, uh... I went to hear Bob Schuler preach in the evening, and the rest of the day I spent in my apartment. Well, 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 I'm sorry I missed old Bob on Christmas myself. Uh, what did he preach about? Uh, he talked about the uh, uh, fireman's football team and uh, Mayor Cryer. Did he read from notes as usual? No, he uh, spoke uh, extemporaneously. That's interesting, isn't it, Crucial? Old Bob Schuler talking about the fireman's football team <laughs> on Christmas Day. Yeah, I got a kick out of that. I uh, say, Captain, if you don't want me in here, I'll get out, uh, get at the rest of that evidence on the Kokumoto case. All right, Cruz. How's the quizzing going? Bill just trapped the doctor on the subject of Bob Schuler's sermon on Christmas. He gave me the office to check it. Hello? Reverend Schuler? 
Deputy Cushon of the Sheriff's Office, Reverend Killer. Yes, what can I do for you? Do you remember the text of your sermon on Christmas? Uh, yes. Did you talk about the fireman's football team and Mayor Cryer? I certainly did not. I preached the story of the nativity. Well, I was just interested to know. Hey, what is this, a joke? Oh, well, I'm checking a story of the suspect. He's trying to use you as an alibi. Thanks a lot, sir. You're quite welcome. Cut the dope. One strike on the doctor. Now, uh, Dr. McMillan, did you and Mrs. Appleby... That uh, evidence uh, doesn't seem to tally on that locomotive case, Captain. I didn't think it would. Now, uh, let's see. Where were we? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. McMillan, did you and Mrs. Appleby always get along together? Oh, yes. We were the best of friends. Then why did you crush in her skull on Christmas morning? I didn't. You're positive you didn't kill Mrs. Appleby? That's right. But there's a blood stain on your coat lapel right uh, now. Why? Oh, oh, that, oh, that I, I... Why, I... I didn't much about that while I, while I was shaving. You, you can uh, see her on my cheek uh, where I cut myself. In the habit of shaving with your coat on? Uh, oh, I... Uh, it, it, well, uh, perhaps you'd like to see the body of the woman you didn't kill. Uh, yes. I think that's the best way to end this unfortunate case of mistaken identity. I, I'm positive Mrs. Appleby is not dead. To the mortuary in San Fernando, Captain Bright escorts his prisoner, there to inspect the body of the murder victim. Well, Doctor, is this Mrs. Appleby? Yeah. It looks something like her. You recognize this human claw, don't you? No, I never saw that finger before. However, I am convinced that this is Mrs. Appleby. And I'm convinced that you killed her. <laughs> there, my dear Captain, you are in error. Back at headquarters, the baffled officers consider their case. Well, boys, we've got a corpse, and we know whose it is. And we've got a reasonable suspicion of the identity of the murderer. But our evidence against the doctor is all circumstantial. Quite right. And insufficient to convict him. Or for that matter, even to obtain an indictment. What gets me is the fellow's calmness. He's too calm. An innocent person would be more flustered than he is. I wouldn't be surprised if he had a previous criminal record. Crucian. Yes, Captain. Send his prints and mug to Washington for a check, will you? Yes, sir. I'll take care of it. Now, um... Let's go over this evidence again. First, here's the fact. We found canvas and a rope like that in the garage of Mrs. Appleby's house. Which doesn't lead us anywhere, excepting to indicate that she was murdered in her own home. But have you noticed the knots with which the sack is tied? What about them? They're all the same. And I observed that the knots used to truss up the body were the same as these used on the sack. Any of you boys recognize this type of knot? Maybe the murderer was a sailor. Well, the devil he was. These knots were the kind of doctors used to tie sutures on wounds. I know, I went to medical school for a couple of terms. A physician's knot, eh? Which brings us back to Dr. McMillan. Right. Which is, again, purely circumstantial evidence. Uh, what's the next exhibit? This pair of black gloves. It's on the left hand one in Mrs. Appleby's home, the right hand one in the doctor's apartment. Hey. That reminds me of an interesting fact. What's that? Have you noticed that none of the friends and neighbors of Mrs. Appleby, even including the doctor, had ever observed that claw finger on her right hand? That's right. And that's the one point in which we'd hoped to get an identification. My guess would be that she wore gloves and always kept the deformity hidden. So? Suppose uh, that there was um, a struggle. Mrs. Appleby ripped off her glove to, to fight the doctor off, to, uh, well, to scratch him. He's got scratches on his face, if you remember. But he never got them shaving. And as I pointed out to him, it isn't customary to shave with your coat on. But a scratched face would bleed onto the lapels of his coat. Right. So after the struggle, which resulted in Mrs. Appleby's murder, Dr. McMillan, looking around the room for damaging evidence, saw the glove, stuffed it into his pocket, took it to his apartment. All very well. But still, circumstantial. We, we need more than that. Uh, Crucian. Yes, sir? You get those inquiries off regarding Dr. McMillan's record, if any. And in the meantime, the rest of you boys get busy rounding up friends of the doctor and of Mrs. Appleby and see what they have to say. Oh. 
While the sheriff's office awaits a reply to their inquiry regarding Dr. McMillan's record, deputies are busy interrogating friends and neighbors of the murdered woman, while national publicity, given the case by the press, helps the work of the officers. Finally, Captain Bright interviews the doctor again. Now, uh, Dr. McMillan, I believe you told me that you and Mrs. Appleby got along very well together. Oh, we did. Now, several months ago, you two took a uh, trip east, didn't you? Yes, we went to Chicago to look over some of Mrs. Appleby's holdings. And in Chicago, you stayed at an apartment managed by a Mrs. Carl Speech, didn't you? Uh, yes. Mrs. Speech has written us, informing us that you quarreled frequently while there, and that on one occasion, Mrs. Appleby screamed for help. And Mrs. Speech was forced to unlock the door to go to her rescue. She states that she found Mrs. Appleby almost unconscious, and that you swore at her and left the room. Mrs. Speech said that Mrs. Appleby confided in her that she was in constant fear that you would kill her. What have you to say to this? Uh, Mrs. Speech was jealous. I think she had a crush on me. What she says is not true. It's spite work. Perhaps. Uh, tell me, Doctor, have you ever been arrested? No. No? Recognize these papers? No, that's strange. They are your record from Leavenworth, where you were sentenced for selling narcotics while you were practicing medicine in Waco, Texas. Well, I had forgotten about that. Rather a convenient memory you have, Doctor. You came back from uh, Chicago by way of the Yellowstone, didn't you, Doctor? Yeah. Yes. How did you know? Oh, well, we have our ways of obtaining information. Did you have any disagreements with Mrs. Appleby while you were visiting the Yellowstone? I... Uh, no. You don't seem very positive. The answer is no. Not according to our information. It is a matter of record at the park ranger's office that you attacked Mrs. Appleby and would have choked her to death had not a couple of rangers interfered. What about that? I have nothing to say. Now, uh, when did you last see Mrs. Appleby? December 22nd. You're positive about that? Yes, yes, positive. Yet your photograph has been identified as that of a man seen on Mrs. Appleby's front porch on the day before Christmas, December 24th, arguing with her. A few moments later, you were seen walking toward the bus stop, while Mrs. Appleby followed you, loudly abusing you. Why, Dr. McMillan, we have the statements of half a dozen people to whom Mrs. Appleby has confided her fear that someday you would kill her for her money. You see, Doctor, your victim's hand... That hand is so much like a claw. It's stretching after you from the grave, reaching for you, clutching for its vengeance. A pity speech, Captain. But you can't scare me that way. Well, what have you got to say? What do you think of the discrepancies in your stories? Well, I must admit it sounds pretty bad, but I... I didn't kill Mrs. Appleby. We're convinced that you did. And we're going to see that you stand trial for her murder. <laughs> The evidence procured by Captain Bright and his men is sufficient to obtain an indictment from the grand jury charging Dr. McMillan with murder. But days and days of intensive work follow, during which the sheriff's office seeks to build their case so strong that the doctor cannot possibly beat them before the jury. On February 14, 1928, Dr. McMillan goes on trial before Judge Edmonds in Superior Court. Point by point, the prosecution breaks down the doctor's story. You have testified, Dr. McMillan, that you have but one bank account in your name. Is that correct? It is. And perhaps you can explain to the court the existence of these four passbooks from four different banks in which you have deposited and from which you have withdrawn large sums. He told me Mrs. Appleby was going to San Diego. He told me Mrs. Appleby had gone east. Mrs. Appleby and I never had a serious quarrel. I had to drag Dr. McMillan away from Mrs. Appleby when he was choking her to death in Yellowstone last summer. She told me that they quarreled constantly and that she feared Dr. McMillan would kill her someday. I attended the Trinity Methodist Church Christmas night and the Reverend Schuller did not speak from notes. I spoke from notes Christmas evening as I do at every time. I'm a member of Trinity and I know Dr. McMillan, but I'm positive he was not in church Christmas night. I knew nothing of Mrs. Appleby's death until Captain Bright informed me that she had been murdered. And how does it happen that arresting officers found in your pocket a newspaper clipping telling of the finding of her body? Mrs. Appleby's alleged will, which grants Dr. McMillan power of attorney, is, in my opinion, a forgery and written in Dr. McMillan's own handwriting. Well, I 
last time I saw Mrs. Appleby was on December 22nd when she left for San Diego. I saw them quarreling on the day before Christmas. Yes, and I did too. And so did I. I was merely her business manager. Yet these photosets and hotel registers prove that you posed as man and wife on your trip to Chicago. No, I... I'm not a registered physician. Yet you posed as one and practiced medicine in several towns in Texas. I did not kill Mrs. Appleby. That remains for the jury to decide. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we have proven beyond doubt shadow that Dr. McMillan has studiously engineered a careful plot to gain control of the poor victim's estate, an estate worth nearly a million dollars. A prize well worth any cost an unscrupulous blackguard, such as the defendant has shown himself to be. Terrorizing this poor woman, he slowly gained control of all of her affairs. And then, having no further use for his victim, he brutally murdered her, wrapped her body in a canvas sack, and tied the package with a damning trademark, a knot with which only physicians are acquainted. We have, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, provided you with a pack. You have the body. You have the motive, and we have shown you the killer. It is for you to decide the degree of his guilt. For in the minds of all of you, there can be no question of innocence. This man has broken the ancient law. Thou shalt not kill. I invoke another ancient law. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask that you find the defendant guilty and recommend for him the penalty of death. Dr. Charles M. McMillan, rise and face the court. Before I pass judgment on you, have you anything to say? Uh, I am not guilty. In the opinion of the jury, you have been found so. And in reviewing the evidence and the discrepancies in your defense, I concur with the opinion of the jury. There is no question in my mind but that the verdict of first-degree murder is a fair one. Therefore, I sentence you to be confined in San Quentin Penitentiary for the rest of your natural life. And furthermore, I recommend that no parole shall ever be granted you. McMillan appealed his case, the court upheld the verdict of guilty, and Dr. McMillan was taken to Folsom Penitentiary, where he is still confined. He still refuses to confess his guilt, although there can be no question in the mind of any person who reads the evidence, deputy sheriffs piled up against him. You will note in our dramatization of this case that we did not intimidate the doctor at any time. We did not use any third-degree methods or any rough stuff. We do not believe in hard-boiled tactics in the sheriff's office. It is not our business to convict criminals, and we never find it necessary to resort to brutality. We proceed in a business-like way to gather evidence for use in the court. We are just as eager to get evidence which will free a suspect as to convict him if he is innocent. There are thousands of men behind prison walls today who thought they could beat the law, but our deputy sheriffs and other law enforcement officials uncovered evidence which brought punishment to everyone. You can't make crime pay. Thank you, Sheriff Fiskalou. Ladies and gentlemen, police cars make an ideal testing laboratory for gasoline. They use the same road you do, but drive them harder and faster. And they have proved, to the complete satisfaction of the biggest gasoline users in the West, that Rio Grande Cracks gasoline is the most powerful, most economical, and speediest. When it comes to testing motor oil, well, you'll admit that any oil chosen by the United States Navy year after year is certainly the best money can buy. Yet for only 25 cents a quart, you can buy Sinclair motor oil in cans, the same oil your Navy uses at Rio Grande service stations everywhere. 
So, you see, your neighborhood independent dealer offers you the best values of all. Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline and Sinclair Motor Oil. Each proved best by the hardest possible test. Morning, all cars. Attention, all cars at Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. Cancellation of broadcast 86 regarding an unidentified murder victim. The body has been identified and murder is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and rolls. Uh-huh.